Welcome back, my lovely. This is Erin Price, founder of the Mastectomy Guide, bringing hope to breast surgery patients through the art and science of massage therapy, research, and human-centric stories. In this episode, we are going into part two of the conversation with Kathy Ryan, and we are going further into the science of fascia, connective tissue disorders, products for scar healing, fascial crimp, and even something about advancing the profession through advanced practice studies. I'm going to start the episode slightly back from where we ended the last one so you can catch up and then we will jump right into it. Yeah, And, you know, talking about complex um, fascia and connective tissue disorders, how do you work with scars with people who maybe they have the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or they have other connective tissue disorders? Do you notice a difference in how you approach people um, with- not so, not so much how I approach people, but one of the things that came out of some, the, some of the fascia research and, and just the Ehlers-Danlos or, or hypermobility types of syndromes and connective tissue, is that individuals with those types of uh, disorders have a tendency to overproduce collagen. Oh, they're over so, they're, so they're much more prone to excessive collagen productive following injury or surgery. Interesting. So how is it that they're hypermobile if they're creating more collagen? Because collagen is stiff by nature, right? So Not, not necessarily. I mean, collagen can stiffen and unstiffened depending upon what it's being asked to do. Collagen doesn't have the same stretch capacity right. as say a muscle fiber because it doesn't have the same collagen to elastin ratio, but collagen is pliable. You know, I liken it to like a piece of licorice. Right. You know, where you can take licorice and you can kind of do this and, you know, because yeah. yeah, it needs to be able to do that in order for us to achieve, you know, movement, right? So, yeah, so for, and I don't know all the signs behind it because I don't think they know yet why, but there does seem to be a tendency to overproduce. Maybe there's just that sense within the, their, their system of, of laxity. So we got to, you know, when there's injury or there's insult in some way to the tissue, we got to get more there because there's this right. sense of. Of, of laxity I, I'm stabbing I, and I'm like <laughs> probably, I have no science behind that but you know that's a guess yeah it's probably a good guesstimate because the body's trying to overcome that feeling I would assume of instability and that mm -hmm. feeling of like oh this is moving way farther than I am comfortable with so let's bring in some reinforcements and try and you know shore that up and right. so you know how do scars form when people have these, you know, hypermobile tissues? Do they form in a way that is more rigid, less rigid? How, and how does that affect how you work with them? Well, and I mean, there, and there's more. So again, I work with them the same way that I work with anyone that comes into my, my practice, that it would appear that their body has overdone it on the collagen after a surgery or an injury. And again, it goes right back to, okay, it's fibrotic collagen. So it might be this much or it might be this much, but it's still fibrotic collagen. Right. So I'm working with it in the same way. Right, right. Cool. So you don't really have to make any kind of modification. I guess that's where you are really approaching the person who's on your table and what stage of healing they're in and whether or not they are, um, you know, experiencing discomfort with what you're doing or, you know, it's just reading, reading the patient that's in front of you basically. Yeah. And, and it kind of goes right back to what I mentioned earlier about in the area of wound healing research, they discovered there are two things that are the primary driver of the overexpression of collagen. So I mean, you know, I'm always mindful of those two things and those apply to people with, who have a, some kind of genetic tendency to overproducing scar material, right? right? You know, immobilization also can impact you know, because when we're not moving, it may not necessarily be more collagen is produced, but the collagen that is produced is more abnormal when we don't move. So yeah. we get a higher tendency of what would be described as pathological crosslinks that inhibit, you know, the sliding of the collagen fibers with respect to their neighbor. 
um, as well as the collagen itself is more rigid, um, lumpy, not as much crimp, because um, collagen crimp is very important with respect to the springiness of our collagen and the juiciness of our collagen. And this is probably one of the best books if you want to dive into crimp. Um, that's one of Robert Schleip's things is the crimpiness of collagen. Oh, and it's so a it like it wavy. Oh, yeah. So if, if you see, and that, I think there might even be, I don't know if there's photos in our book, but I know in some of the fashion books, they'll show these photos of the collagen that you might be too young for this, Erin. But back in the day when I was a kid, we used to make accordions out of paper, you know, where we'd fold the paper like yes. an accordion. And yes. that's what the collagen looks like. You know, it's kind of like that accordion sort of thing. So it's not really stretching, but it gives it this sort of pliability and, you know, springiness. So when you compress it, like the Achilles tendon, for example, when we compress it um, and the fascia, plantar fascia, uh, it actually will spring, you know, hence the spring in our step. Yes. You know, that's kind of what it talks about is, you know, as, as our foot steps down, we stretch it out and then it springs back. It gives us this propulsion. So it makes us much more efficient mm -hmm. in, in movement. So when our collagen is really stiff and we start to lose the spring in our step, our movements are much more stiff and as well we have to use a lot more muscular power to produce movement which create leads to fatigue which can uh, put us at a greater risk for injuries right right and i'm also thinking in my mind if you're if you've got this direction of the fascia which is or the collagen fibers which is it's like a 3d structure that's also going to create room for fluid in there yes. it's also going to create you know like plumpness so that everything is not flat and stuck to each other. That's it, right. It's got room in there yeah. to, to have fluid and to move and to be, yeah, like elastic and, and, and multi-layered in a, a more 3d way. Yeah. Yeah. So fascinating, right? The body's just it like endlessly fascinating. Amazing. Yeah. So um, let's talk about some of the other questions that were in here. Uh, one of them was related to fibrosis pro progression in respect to age. How does that play out? And let's talk about, well, there's a couple of different ways that things can fibrose, but one of the ways, of course, that I'm thinking of is through radiation because of, yes. um, you know, people going through breast cancer and getting radiation. So maybe let's yeah. start there and what happens as you age with fibrosing. Well, yes. And I'm a good person to ask about aging. <laughs> Um, I mean, with respect to radiation and fibrosis, I mean, and, and any type of burn, you know, there's going to be damage to the collagen that results in the collagen being fibrotic, you know, and one of the challenges with radiation is that the instigators of the fibrosis stick around for a really long time. So very different than say, if we've got profuse swelling that's causing changes in, co in collagen that we can, you know, but we've got, you know, this radioactive type of components sticking around for a really long time that can continue to instigate that cycle, which is why it's such a challenging thing right. to, work, to work with. Right, right. Um, you know, and we, and you know, one of the things I'll say about radiation too is the fragility of the tissue. So we have to be very careful with respect to when and how we use our hands when we're working with people who have been through radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to use one of Nancy's, and this kind of applies to seroma, which is one of the other questions too. One of Nancy's famous lines is if it's open and oozing and not yours, don't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> Great rule of thumb. And I live, I live by that. That's funny. you know, and you can you can see that weepiness, you know, in that very fragile tissue. So I'm not doing any direct work where there's that weepiness because there's because of the fragility of the tissue, but also the higher potential for some form of infection. Because the the barrier there to protect has been compromised. So we got to be really, really mindful of that. But that doesn't mean that I can't work an out lying areas around that is going to have some kind of impact, right. you know, to try to get things moving. Um, Nancy's area of one of her areas of expertise was with burn scars. That was her research as burn scars. One of the challenges of working with 
more mature burn scars once things have healed and there's no more weeping and oozing is it feels very much like leather. It's very difficult to get a hold of it and pick it up, mm -hmm. which is kind of one of my standard ways to work. So I'll employ more of I kind of kind of like the John Barnes stuff where you kind of push into the barrier um, in a way that's very comfortable for the patient to receive. And just I, I'll do what I call like these micro shearings where I'm just very gently kind of going back and forth really slowly until I feel the tissue starting to soften and it starts to become more pick upable a little bit. Um, now we can't do this because of the current uh, re restrictions around scope, but Nancy uses uh, like massage cupping, yeah. or myofascial cupping, like the silicone cups. Yeah. And she's also used vacuum cupping for burn scars. And, and it, very different than cupping um, from the traditional Chinese medicine perspective. So I'm not talking about the glass cups, the, the moxie bush and the fire cupping and that kind of stuff. I'm talking about what's called submaximal lift. So just, an, just enough suction to kind of lift one layer off of another, and then you use that tool to shear across it. Um, Nancy found that really effective in her practice to be yeah. able to be able to do that um, yeah. because it was painful to try to pick it up. Whereas she found with the cupping, it was actually, it was not painful for the patient and it was very productive. That's very cool. Yeah. And I know certainly in the research that I've read, cupping comes up quite a bit like this, what you're talking about, more like the massage vacuuming and sort of lifting up the layers, not the moxibustion yeah. one, but that does come yeah. up as, as useful and effective for working with the fibrous tissues. And very I can much so. I, I don't know if this is actually what's happening, but in my own mind, it's creating, you know, by, by, by the lifting motion, it's creating kind of a vacuum inside that's allowing the fluid to come in and um, refill the area and plump it up and, and rehydrate it. Is that accurate or is that just my own artistic? No, I think there may be some validity to that. Um, one of my favorite pieces of research that I came across, it was, I, I don't remember if it was at the Fascia Congress or the International Massage Therapy Research Congress. It was one of those, it might've been the Fascia one. Um, but uh, a woman by the name of Dr. Helga Pohl, P-O-H-L, she's out of Germany. She had done this piece of research where she used real-time ultrasound because um, <clears throat> she's a physician and had access to groovy tools like that. <laughs> but she was an interesting physician. I mean, it's different in Europe, right? So she was a physician that did massage therapy. Yeah, oh, that's unusual. So, yeah. and she, she used a technique that she called modified skin rolling, right. which which I got very excited because when I saw her demonstrating it, it looked a lot like the way I used my hands. So I'm like, oh, so cool. <laughs> but anyway, the, sort of the, the nuts and bolts of her research was is that she palpated the patient areas that she determined were restriction due to fibrotic collagen, basically just restrictions in the tissue. Um, and then she found another area that wasn't restricted based on her palpation. And she used like her ultrasound thing to show what the collagen strands look like in the skin in that region. And then what the collagen strands look like in the skin in this region. And then she treated the non-affected area and the collagen strands looked exactly the same. They didn't change at all after her treatment, but in the restricted area, in the affected area, she did a lift. And instead, you know, our traditional skin rolling would go across an area. She just did a lift in this, what I call micro shearing. So she did a lift in this micro shearing and then she showed the collagen strands again and they had gotten bigger in diameter. Oh, they got all filled up. Yes. I love it. They got they, She reconstituted the sun-dried tomato, as I like <laughs> to call it. <laughs> she brought it back to life. That is so I, I like lost my mind. Oh, I God. like, I was like, oh, it was one of those moments for me that was just like, you know, I could feel that that's what's happening. And I, and I had a sense that that's the change that was happening based on some of the fascia research that was starting to come out, especially the Steckler's work. But to actually, there's something about seeing it and we shouldn't be so, you know, see it to believe it. And I'm not, but it was just so cool. It's really cool. To, it was just really cool to see it. Yeah, like, sure. yes, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm, yes. <laughs> 
I love it. Well, do you think one day you'd be able to drum up that video? Because I would love to see that video. That would be really amazing. Um, I don't have video, but I do have permission from her. I've got the photos, like her photos that she took. Oh. Wow, uh, I've got them in my slide presentation when I when I teach because I contacted her and she wrote back to me, which is oh, like okay. the coolest thing ever. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if we've got it in the book or not. I can't remember if we've got it in the book or not, but I I do. Oh, I know I know where it is. Yes, Nancy and I did a chapter for this book. This is David Lazondek, kind of one of the fascia writer dudes. Uh, we're chapter 18 scars and we got Dr. Pohl's permission to uh, publish her really cool pictures of what it looks like. Let me see if I can find it here. That is give, so me awesome. moment, give me a moment. I know it's really cool. Yeah, because um, when you're able to see things like that, it really does bring it home. And I remember in the, oh, there it is. So the top one. Maybe you can explain those pictures. Yeah, the top one is before. Before, okay. The bottom one is after. So you can see the diameter of the oh, collagen yeah. has changed, right? Oh yeah, so much. It looks like it's it's way more, it's just not such a dense, hard line. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. oh, that and is at, so cool. And at the time, cause she did that like back in 2010, at the time, you know, she had some theories on what was happening. Um, but since then, there has been more fascia research, particularly the Steckos research on shearing and hyaluronin, that quite likely, I think, explains what just happened there. And that's really, you know, gratifying for me to know because shearing, it's not a complicated technique, but it's one that mm -hmm. I gravitate to all the time because I just find that it works. It's my gun too. Yeah. And I don't think in order to affect change that you need to be super fancy dancy fireworks like this is something that's no one's ever seen before like i don't think it has to be like that like things can be simple and be very effective you know and that's another na thing nancy and i and this is no slight towards anyone out there but this is another nancy and i's things you are not going to see smithing and ryanization anytime soon you know <laughs> we're just not into like trademarking what these do right because you can do it, that person can do it, that person can do it. It's like, you know, I didn't invent this stuff. Right. You know, I mean, I had really good teachers that, you know, over the years that have taught me some amazing things. And I'm just like a total nerd bag. So I will take credit for the fact that I hit the books and the research hard because I love it. I enjoy it. And you could set me on a beach with a stack of research abstracts and a cold beverage and I'd be in heaven. Remind no. me that when we go to take a vacation together somewhere, I'll be like, I'm going snorkeling. See you with your research. <laughs> That's funny. No, I understand though, because looking into the research, it's so fascinating. And I looked into it when I was a practitioner, but now that I've started teaching courses, I look into it way more than I did before. And there are so many rabbit holes that you can go down. And sometimes yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's four hours later. Like what happened? And I know, I know, yeah, because it's so fascinating to look and, but the thing I'm also aware of with research is that a it's our knowledge to date and things can change. And so they think, oh, this is the way that it is. And then yeah. a number of years later, they're like, actually, it's a little different than what we thought it was. So just because it's showing today that this is what research is showing, it doesn't mean it's set in stone. And two just because research hasn't looked at something yet doesn't mean it's not valid. It just means research hasn't yet looked at it. And so, you know, research is wonderful, but I don't think it's the be all and end all, but I do think it's extremely useful to bring some validity and deeper understanding of what you're working with. But if you're in a treatment with somebody and you got that magic going on and you're like, wow, I don't even know what that move is that I just did, but holy, that was cool. And it worked. It did something just because research hasn't said that move hasn't right. shown that it worked. Doesn't mean it didn't Absolutely. work. Because Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, and it's so interesting that you say that. I mean, there are three pillars to evidence informed. Right. One is science or research. Two is clinician experience. Right. Skill and, you know, skill. Three is patient. 
you know, what, what they understand and know and their input about what they want. Mm -hmm. So those are the three things that factor into evidence informed. You know, and what you say about just because it hasn't been researched doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's so important. We, and we've seen that, you know, I'm going to give a classic example of that. Um, I can't remember what year. It wasn't that long ago. It was probably right around 2016, because it was right around when Nancy and I were just finishing the book. And then there was this like groundbreaking thing that came out of, I can't even remember which university now, but by the way, there are lymphatic vessels in the brain. Oh yes, I remember that. You know, yeah. it's like, yes. How, you know, cause, and it's so interesting, right? Cause if you look at all like the lymphatic maps, you know, the, the lymphatics stop here, like at the terminus, right? Yeah. They stop yeah. at the terminus. It's like, did not someone ever think that they probably, <laughs> oh, awesome. so just because they hadn't been visualized before or seen, it was kind of like, oh, by the way, we have a glimp glymphatic system. Well, of course we do. My goodness. Like we wouldn't have a human body where it would just mm, stop the lymphatic vessels there. Oh. You know, and it's so interesting because Leon Chapow, who was one of the original um, organizers of the very first Basha Congress, who's like, he was the editor of the, one of the big journals, research journals. And he's someone that often said, just because it hasn't been discovered yet doesn't mean that it doesn't exist or that it isn't important or isn't effective, effective you know, mm -hmm. effective. So, you know, that was one of his things as well yeah yeah and it's yeah. an ever-evolving uh platform you know things well change. we've we've seen so much stuff blown out of the water you know um just before the first fascia congress gil headley had his fuzz speech do you remember that gil headley the fuzz speech mm -hmm. it was it was like it went viral for in manual therapy anybody interested in fascia gil did this fuzz speech because he's doing all the cadaver stuff and he could see in the cadavers where there's this network of fine fuzz-like strands that were kind of matted together. And if we don't move, they develop and then we lose more movement. And then, you know, and then Dr. Grimberto comes along and shows endoscopic video of, of superficial fascia or that loose connective tissue network that creates a sliding interface. Um, and all that fuzzy stuff are actually the strands that make up that network. But when you put fluid in there and living tissue, it looks very different when it's all glommed together. So then that prompted Gil to go back and say, I need to rethink this fun speech, right. you know? And, and I mean, and he owned it, you know? And he was one of the ones that said, you know, we can't get too married to something in fascia research because next year or the next Congress, that's going to get blown out of the water because, you know, we're delving into this more and delving in it into ways that we couldn't have previously, like with endoscopic capacity to see the human body live moving, yes. Yes. which is what Grimberto was doing. He was getting people to, he was already, they already were scheduled for hand surgery and he got permission to do some looking around in there while he was in there from the patient and got them to do movements. The first time we got to see how things slide. Right. You know, and that was one of the first, that was the first fascia Congress. And again, we just lost our mind because the first time we actually got to see what that looks like. That looks like, yeah. And that's why I think surgical videos and surgical images are so incredibly valid because they actually show what's happening in a live body. The cadavers, you know, is useful in terms of, Very much so. yeah, this is layers. This is where this is. And yep. but it's different tissue because it's dead. It's not living. And when you're watching the surgical videos and you're seeing surgical images, that's a live body. That's actually what we're working with. And right. I think it's incredibly valid. So my programs are packed full of images, which sometimes are hard to look at. Yeah. Because, you know, they're juicy and red and all sorts of things that, you know, if you're yep. sensitive to images, they can be hard to see. But sure. I think it's super valid because then, you know, you, because all we get to see is the skin when we're working with massage therapy, we just see the skin and we're imagining yeah. what's going on underneath. But when you can yeah. actually see the body opened up and you can see how contractile things are and, and how things move and how much cauterization they do and dehydration of the tissues, like it's extensive. It's absolute, it's far beyond what I ever thought it was like watching the lat splat video where they pick up the whole lats 
and they're cauterizing and dehydrating the whole way along and then they put it back we've got this little discrete scar right here that's like this was the incision site but this whole area underneath is now it's developing um, adhesions all the way through and it will have its own type of scar tissue through there because all of that has been severed it has to rejoin and it's been dried and all the blood vessels have been stopped and you know it's got a lot that's going on under there but without seeing those surgical videos you'd never know you'd never know any of that ab like, absolutely this is what i'm working on yeah yeah and you know there's that whole interruption of that loose connective tissue that constitutes some kind of you know sliding capacity right and as you say you've got you know the cauterization of of all these vessels okay there goes the nutrition mm -hmm. to tissue for a while until the body you know the angiogenesis is part of wound healing it does happen these vessels do regrow not immediately it takes a while for those to regrow so that you know and if in the meantime if you've got areas of denser tissue those newly growing structures whether it be nerve blood or lymphatic vessel have a harder time pushing through that denser tissue that comes from a, some of Jeff Bob's research. Um, one of the things he noticed is that as you know, if in the area of fibrosis, newly forming nerves have a harder time pushing through that denser tissue. We can, I think, pretty much, um, you know, appreciate that's probably going to be the same for blood vessels and lymphatic vessels. Yeah, it, it makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. If you've got an area which is you know, it's really loose, it's plump, and they want to move through their baby tissues. And they're like, Oh, it's not too much resistance, I can move through here. That's great. Or they're little baby tissues. And they're like, I can't get through here, they're just not going to form as well. It's just it's For like sure. really impossible to get not impossible, but very difficult to get through tissue, which is really hard and shrunk and, you know, very, very dense. Yeah, I saw a really cool video clip, and it's no longer on his website. Alistair McLaughlin, he teaches a scar tissue stuff in uh, uh, Europe. He's in Germany. And he he did this thing, again, high-density real-time ultrasound, got together with some physician who visualized an area, I think it was a C-section scar, visualized the area of the scar. And you could see, like, blood flow, you know, kind of around, but there wasn't any direct blood flow like near the scar. And then Alistair did some scar tissue work, very much similar to some of the stuff that myself, Nancy, Sharon Wheeler, who's all from the States, you know, his techniques look similar to some of the stuff that we do. And then they revisualized the area and you could actually see the blood flow. I know, I know, I know, like, right? So maybe it was just that the air was so compressed that there were vessels in there, but they were being so squished and then once you kind of open it up, it's like, oh, the juice can flow through now. Right. So, you know, and, and again, I don't have the hard science to say that that's what happened, but, you know, that kind of seems to me physiologically plausible that maybe that's what's going on in there. Yeah. But it was really cool to see the distinct difference between before and after and the amount of blood flow that was going in and around the scar. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Cool. So um, we have a couple more questions that were from yeah. this group uh one of them is in relating to scar creams and lotions do you have anything that you like to use that is helpful no you know i don't i don't really have a particular thing that i use i mean when i'm doing fascial work i don't use any lotion because i find it harder to actually hook in or get a hold of the tissue so i don't use lotion when i'm doing the fibrosis shearing kind of stuff for lymphatic work, I'll use a little bit of lotion just to get a little bit more glide, but but not a whole lot. Right. Um, I mean, as far as if they're asking about like lotions for the patient to apply themselves to help the scar stay more soft and pliable, you know, I think there's I think there's been you know some of the usual stuff that might be recommended to people like vitamin E for some folks. Um, one of the things I will say is that my natural path feels very strongly that vitamin C is extremely important to healing. Um, you shouldn't use it before surgery because it does, it is um, a thinner, a blood thinner. So you shouldn't be taking high doses of vitamin C before surgery, but she's really big on vitamin C after surgery. And vitamin C is one of those things that collagen really needs a lot of to form in a healthy way. 
So can you apply it topically, like a vitamin C? Is there well, such you can a thing? Get like you can get like different facial creams and stuff with vitamin C in it. Like they they put vitamin C in different like facial creams and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had some clients use rosehip oil, very high in vitamin C. Um, they've had really good results with that. They seem to have a preference for that. Um, it seems to be another one that uh, a lot of people really seem to help make the soft, the soften, you know, the texture of the scar. Yeah. Makes it just feel not as dense and stiff, right? Yeah. Just- yeah. It softens it up nicely. So yeah. So I'd say rose hip oil is one of those things that I've had some patients report back that has worked well for them. Cool. And have you had any experience with people using Mepitel film on their skin during radiation? Um, specifically, no, I can't say that I've had, I certainly haven't had anybody come into my practice with it on, whether or not it had been applied to them right after their surgery. Because sometimes I don't see folks for, you know, sometimes they don't find me or whatever the case may be. I might not see them for three months out type of thing. Yeah. Or the rehab not going the way that they had hoped. So the physiotherapist, okay, I think maybe you should go see Kathy kind of thing. Right. Um, but I did reach out to um, some folks and, you know, whether it is the, the film or different types of creams that they apply to the area of radiation to protect it during you know, when it's at its most vulnerable state. Yeah. Um, again, as a massage therapist, uh, whether it's a topical or abandoning, I don't touch it. I don't anywhere near it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Be, how about you? I mean, that might be more of a question for you. Yeah, well, I, I've i only seen one person who's used it, but the results were amazing. So I saw pictures of her. I didn't see her with it actually on, but the pictures, it looks like saran wrap. It's thin. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. Through it, it sticks to your your tissues like you know, an adhesive, uh, structure looks like plastic really. Mm -hmm. And, but the effects were amazing because the side that wasn't radiated had the normal kind of skin elasticity and plumpness and, you know, normally radiated skin, it's very dry. It's dehydrated, it's dense. It's, you know, and even so it's more fragile. So it's, you know, it's got a very interesting quality to it. That's very noticeable. It's rough. It's like, it's noticeable yeah. where the Mepitel film had been. It was really felt similar to the unaffected side. It was very elastic. It was soft. It was hydrated and it didn't have shrinkage the way yeah. that mediated tissue normally does. And I was really amazed. I was like, oh, what is this stuff? Yeah, that's one of the issues with burn scars of, of any type, like or burns of the tissue is the dehydration. Right. So, yeah. you know, that's one of the things that products of that nature are used for is to not only protect the vulnerable tissue, but to help maintain, you know, the 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 juiciness to help it not dehydrate so much so that it stays softer, more pliable, more, more pliable. juicy. Yeah. yeah. Juicy. Yeah. And it just doesn't because you know, a radiated breast even without surgery, it's gets smaller and, and harder. And, you know, I've seen patients, they started out more or less symmetrical, you know, no one's exactly symmetrical, but more or less. And then, you know, their radiated breast ended up, you know, contracting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It really made a big difference. But I remember reading this case study on the heal well website years ago, and it was talking about somebody's self massage that they did through radiation and the was like whatever you can do it if you want to it's like a, a non-issue like yeah like meh just d- wrote it off and the woman if, was like, if it feels nice yeah yeah totally and the woman was like okay well I'm gonna do it anyway so she just kept self-massaging all the way through and the doctor eventually was like oh what like you're this is very different than what people normally present with and at the end her breasts w- remained like you know, fairly symmetrical. There was a little bit of shrinkage, but not nearly to the degree that it normally does. And the yeah. doctor sat up and took notice and was like, wow, this is amazing. Like I totally had no idea. And, uh, and so I just think, you know, you're keeping that fluid moving, you're keeping that hydration in the tissues and you're keeping it plumped up and, and alive because especially with blood, you know, all the nutrients come in yeah. the blood. It's, it's, yeah 
food and 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 the lymphatic system i think we yeah. i don't think we've given enough emphasis to the lymphatic system you know and and i will be the first one to admit that my interest in the lymphatic system grew exponentially when i started having conversations with nancy right. about the book because she's a you know mld lady yeah you know diva of the world kind of thing <laughs> so so she really you know and i mean and it was there for me because of that early work with sue and the swelling techniques so it was there for me but she really kind of said you know what i know you're all about fascia but you know lymph is kind of where it's at too right. you know and she's absolutely right i think the three and that's why we cover essentially three systems in the book in more in depth i mean the circulatory system is very important. I'm not, you know, saying that it's not, but we get a lot of that as massage therapists, as manual therapists. So we didn't go into it as much in depth in the book, but we did the nervous system, lymphatic system, fascia connective tissue. Amazing. You know, because if, if you're going to be working with scars or if you're going to be working post-surgically with people, those are really the three systems to really get your head around. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. And I think when you're working with the nervous system, especially it really helps the person's body be able to activate their self-healing capacity. And, you know, then they're getting healing from the inside. It's not just whatever our interventions are, it's their own bodies taking it over and is like, okay, I'm, I know what to do now. And, and they're healing from the inside out, which really is, is the best. And, and ultimately I think it's probably the only way that they can actually heal. And our efforts are an external uh, intervention that is providing effect, but it's their own body, which is taking it up and, and doing something with it. And so then it's their own body, which is healing. And we're helping to open the door and help facilitate the process. And, you know, that circles us right back to the beginning of the therapeutic relationship where if you are helping to create an atmosphere that the person feels like they can heal in and that they can relax into and open into, then you're creating that, uh, at that place that their body can heal in. And I think that's one of our main tasks as a massage therapist is to absolutely that environment that the patient's body then can do its own magic in. Yeah, you know, it is our our ability for me to have a great conversation with you, Aaron, and for these to be able to develop a good conversation with your nervous system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, for sure, for sure. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. How fun. Yay. So and much fun. Yeah. And, you know, as we were talking, there's things that would come up and I'd be like, oh, we could go off in that direction and we could go off in that direction. And um, so I think there's probably more conversations to be had in future which I sure. would love, yeah, if you were ever up for it. Absolutely, and, absolutely. Yeah, and in the meantime, I know that there are people who want to get your textbook and I hmm. definitely recommend it. So how would they find it? What is the best way for them to access your book? I mean, it's it's available on the usual kind of online book places. Um, I know that the if you're an RMTBC member, the RMTBC has a discount code for login books, L-O-G-I-N dot C-A books. Um, their prices are a little bit high. Uh, I'm trying to, I, the Handspring Publishing Company just sold to a new company, so I'm in conversation with them to try to get um, better links for Canadians you know, so that we don't have to pay American dollars and American shipping prices and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm currently working with them to try to get those established. Um, so as soon as I've got something concrete, I will pass that direct link on to you. But like I say, it's out there in the usual kind of places for sure. Um, I'm just looking, I'm just, I'm just looking to get, you know, you know like Amazon and right. You know, the ver various places where a person might go to buy books, they're, they're, they're available. But I'm just looking to see if we can figure out um, a more cost-effective way for us. You know, I'm Canadian, for goodness sake. <laughs> yeah. You shouldn't have to pay in American dollars and have it shipped yeah. in the U.S. Nothing yeah. against the U.S., but you know what? Yeah. Really, 
Half of this book is Canadian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Let's bring it home. Let's bring it home. Let's bring it home. Amazing. And if people wanted to get in touch with you in any way, if they wanted to see more of your work or anything like that, learn about your courses, where would they do that? So email is cryanrmt at gmail.com. And you're well, and I, you can post that, you know, on the, on this uh, podcast, if you'd like um, a couple of places you can find me. One is heal. Well, you mentioned, so heal well oncology massage people in the U S um, I've got a five part uh, exploring fascia series available to them. It's an online course. If you want to understand sort of the basics of fascia science, uh, I totally nerded out for heal well. And then through ABMP, which is one of the American, big American associations, um, Nancy and I have a three-part scar tissue workshop, online workshop available through ABMP. So those are kind of the two places where we've got stuff online available. And then I've done podcasts kind of all over the place, fascia symposium, Polish fascia symposium, and Aaron. Um, Mark Finch, I did one with Mark Finch a number of years ago. So there's some different podcast stuff out there too. Great. So they have lots of opportunity to hear your wisdom and your learning and your um, offerings to this profession, which I will just say a heartfelt thank you for helping to move the profession forward and for being a great person to have a conversation with and for being willing to um, collaborate with other people to help bring this knowledge into the world, because I really think it needs to be here. And this is how it really comes to pass is, you know, people decide, okay, I'm going to look into this more and I'm going to bring this service to the world and I'm going to help, you know, further the conversation on what we actually know as massage therapists and, and where we don't know and areas that we need to continue to look into. And you've been active in that for many years. And so I really thank you for your contributions. They do make a huge difference. And I had so much fun today. This was so good. Well, thank you. And likewise, Erin, I am so grateful that you've created what you've created because now I have this wonderful resource to pass on, pass on to my own patients and as well other colleagues um, so that there's a place that people can go to get this kind of information that's so important. And I agree with you. I think one of the deficits in our profession is that we don't have a great pathway for advanced clinical practice, you know, whereas other professions have those standardized pathways versus, you know, through a master's or whatever process that they have, the institution that they work for, we don't have that, you know, and that's been one of those rants that I've had for a really long time, along with my friend Pam Fitch, is we need that in our profession. We need to establish advanced clinical practice guidelines for certain key areas like oncology, like complex trauma, like compact pain, post-surgical, these areas that are more complex that we have the basics you know, uh, as massage therapist, and we can develop from there, but why not give us these good standardized places where we can go for this learning? 100%. And just on that note, before we sign off the RMTBC, and I'm a committee member on that is developing the advanced practice committee yeah. so that we can actually bring this in and, and have it be a real live thing. Because in, in pretty much every other healthcare profession, that advanced clinical practice is recognized and it is live, there is a way to actually show that you are studying and, and advancing your profession and massage therapy is looking to catch up on that. So the RMTBC is putting effort into that. And I'm grateful that I was invited to be a part of it. And, uh, you know, maybe you're also a good person to have conversations with because you have longevity in this profession and you've been here and you have developed your own advanced practice. And so there's, um, I'm sure wisdom and input that you can what well, and Pam, Pam and I created a concept document that we presented to the regulators, Swam Track. So not just the CMTBC, but the other regulators as well. Because one of our thing was, is, is, you know, for us to move forward as a profession, we need these advanced clinical practice guidelines. But we also want to make sure that there isn't some kind of antiquated legislation in effect that would in, inhibit or restrict our ability to be able to do that. So we've already been having, you know, a while back, we had those kind of conversations with the regulators, because I think that's another piece to this. We can create it, but we got to make sure there isn't some kind of legislation that's been around for far too long mm -hmm. um, that might restrict us in some way and being able to advance ourselves forward. And regulators are always very interested in what's best for the patient. You know, that's that's what they do. It's all about 
safety for the patient and advocating on behalf of the patient. And I think this is an important piece for not only patient safety, but also for the well-being of the patient. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. Well, lots of fun things down the pike. And I, look to, <laughs> I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you so much, Kathy. This has been a blast. Totally my pleasure. You know that. Um,